today's talk will actually relate to what you heard yesterday, a little bit annotation, a lot of omega-3. So, but anyway, eight years ago, we got a challenge from someone involved in aquaculture. He said, the world's population is growing. They need protein. They need actually good food. Agriculture might provide some of it. Fisheries can't be extended. Aquaculture might. So Norwegian aquaculture industry could help. But 70% of the world's fish oil resources is already used for salmon production. So he said, please, biotechnologists, can you find new sustainable producers of omega-3? And we took the challenge. So researchers at NTNU and Sintef are currently looking at microalgae, bacteria, and today's uh, chastochytrids for DHA production. And chastochytrids, I suppose you have never heard about those. They are marine, heterotrophic, unicellular organisms. They are related to algae, but they've never had chloroplasts, so they've never been an algae. But they are really good at making lipids. You can see those white blobs up there. And they are really good at making DHA. 25% of the dry cell dry weight might be DHA. So they are used commercially already. But the productivity might be a little bit low. So this is mostly to remind you that to get fatty acids, you need melonyl-CoA. The organisms have made that is decided I want to make fatty acids. You also need NADPH. And while microalgae and plants, when they want to make polyunsaturated fatty acids, they start with C16 and then elongates and desaturates. Bacteria and chastochytrids have dedicated enzymes that use less enzyme, uh, less energy for the same thing. So the aim of our work is to obtain an increased understanding of the factors that affect the DHA productivity in chastochytrids. And actually, we don't know much about these chastochytrids. I mean, when we look at the annotation, we have enzymes in the TCA that are less than 50% homologous to known enzymes. So that's the problem. But still, we want to identify rate-limiting steps and we want to define the carbon flow. And in this cartoon, when they have enough nitrogen, they will use the carbon for growth and maintenance. When they run out of nitrogen, they will take their surplus carbon into lipid. Here they will decide, should they make DHA or should they make uh, saturated fatty acids? And finally, they decide, do they need more membranes or can they store the lipids? So, the initial study was to do controlled fermentations. You can see the blue growth curve. And you can see that lipid starts to accumulate at the transition phase when nitrogen is depleted. We also have a sample point at well into lipid accumulation stage. And you can see that the fatty acids, we get mostly C16 and DHA. So, some of the results. Uh, for the fatty acid biosynthesis, we can see that the enzyme involved in making melonyl-CoA is upregulated. Great. Some more on FAS, a little bit on PFA. And this enzyme, the last enzyme, that those genes are, some of them are upregulated. So we expect there is a push and pull through that system. Then if you look at the how, this is complicated, but just take what you like. So most of the genes in TCA is not upregulated. Perhaps uh, as you should expect, you have this enzyme AMP deaminase, which signals nitrogen deficiency by inactivating isocitrate dehydrogenase, which means you will get citrate, which will be entering the cytosol. And in most lipid accumulating organisms or anyone to date, an enzyme, ACL, will make acetyl-CoA. 
We don't find any homologous, any protein in our strains homologous to any known ACLs. So we still have no clue, actually, how do these guys make acetyl-CoA in the cytosol. But they do. They have to. So when we come to the NADPH, most of the pathways we looked at that could produce NADPH actually is down-regulated when you come to lipid accumulation. Exception is pentose phosphide cycle. So we can assume Based on RNA-seq, it seems it's that. However, we can't just trust the transcriptome data. We don't know how much is regulated at protein level or at translation level. So what we like to do and what we're starting now is we want more points here. And we want to do proteome and metabolome and fluxome study. We want, and we are making, a metabolic model to integrate all those data because the human mind just can't take in all those data and do anything sensible about it. So then we hope that we can end up in understanding what can be done. And what can be done could be to make a mutant However, the fish feed industry in Norway does not really like GMO at present, so they will have to be changed in that. The other thing is, if you know what's rate limiting, you might do something with how you ferment, how you feed, and in that way induce the natural strains to produce more. So, these are the people involved in doing this, and I thank you for your attention. Helga, for this nice presentation. Questions from the audience? I can have one. So we heard yesterday about uh, phototrophic uh, or autotrophic microalgae. Are there uh, any similarities that you can learn between the network models between these two or are they different with respect to production of these fatty yeah. acids? You can always learn something. The big difference is that the microalgae don't use the dedicated system, they use the FAS. So we can't learn anything on how that splits. Mm -hmm. And of course, they have different problems with phototrophic. You have, you have to ferment in a different way. Mm. Anyone else? Yes, you can. Okay. Yes, yeah, about this ACL, this is just a comment. But you don't need ACL to produce acetyl-CoA, the cytosol. You can shuffle it. I have here a mini review that there is transport in fungi. So maybe that is the yes. solution. Yes, I know. And we have seen that the carnitine, acetyl CoA, Very good. acetyl carnitine could be possible, but that's still a hypothesis because it would be the first lipid accumulating organisms that really does this. Yeah, but the, it's possible. The, the, the message is it's not essential. No. We, there is a bypass. Yeah. That was the remark. Yes. Very interesting. Uh, I'm, I'm just asking you because I don't know, but I think I remember that Thustochytrids, which are a member of the heterocons, they do have a vestigial plastid that's non photosynthetic. Uh, but you may have checked this. Well, the newest papers say they don't have, so I haven't personally checked it. Evolutionary, they have had, that's for sure, because all this group share a common origin with a photosynthetic origin. So I'm, I'm saying this because it could be some interesting genes uh, there for, that it will be relevant for the, for the lipid production. Yeah. No, now I have the problem that the newest paper I found on evolution has said that it was most probably that they have never had it. So the evolutionists are discussing this still. 
<laughs> okay, then once more, uh, Helga, thank you very much. And here is a present from organizers. <laughs>